This is Diary of a Divorcee, and I'm Carrie Pyle Lawrence, and this is the place where we talk about all things post-divorce. And I don't know about you, but anybody who's either contemplating divorce or getting divorced and you have kids, the idea of not screwing your kids up is probably the most important and also the most stressful thing you can possibly even think of. And I know when I was getting divorced, I had no idea. There wasn't any kind of roadmap. I was really at a loss. I didn't know what I was gonna do, how I was gonna do it. I was in the middle of this like contentious divorce. My mother just recently passed away. I was barely able to keep myself in my own head above water. And I didn't even know how I was gonna do the same thing for my kids. And I remember my ex came to me one day and this is before things got like really nasty. And he played me this video and it was of a blended family. And I had never even really seen a blended family or knew what that term was even all about. But essentially it was a man and a woman who had two kids and they had gotten divorced and each of them were in their own relationship. And they essentially created a family unit that was non-traditional. And he showed me this and he was like, this is what I want for us and our kids. And I immediately teared up watching the video because I was like, oh, I do too. I just don't <laughs> want to screw up our kids. <laughs> And it's been almost seven years now that we have been divorced. And I can say that I finally feel like we got to that moment and we've created the blended family that I saw in that video a long time ago. But I also want to talk about the fact that it really wasn't easy. It was really, really difficult. And it wasn't something that I just decided to do that day. And all of a sudden it actually happened because that wasn't the case. And the reason for today's episode about untraditional co-parenting is that I really want to let everybody know that it wasn't just me who did it. It took an entire team of like my whole co-parenting tribe to get there. And one of the people that was really essential in the process is my ex-husband's wife, Denise Lawrence. Hi. I just wanted to have you on so we can really give people a true idea mm -hmm. of what like our co-parenting journey has been because honestly it was really shitty good bad first. and ugly for sure yeah it was yeah. shit <laughs> yeah it was fucking like awful. i hated you i know 100 percent. i'm sure i think the I, feeling was a little mutual <laughs> a little a little mutual yeah <laughs> during that time i was obviously so emotional and broken my whole life exploded mm -hmm. and i'm trying to like put all these pieces back together mm -hmm. i didn't really take any time to think about where you were at that mm -hmm. time you know i was just really consumed with myself yeah but like you were in a completely different spot i mean look i think that the, it's important everyone also knows that it wasn't a normal situation right it wasn't clean you weren't divorced already you guys were going through your divorce for a lot longer than I think both of you thought you were gonna go through the divorce mm -hmm. and it got worse before it got better for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I remember at the very beginning, we would, I would call my ex mm -hmm. and I would have like something to talk to him about the kids or yeah. whatever. And he would always say, oh, hold on, let me get Denise. Yeah. And I was so pissed. Yeah. I was so pissed because I was like, I have to be on a three-way conference call yeah. with two people that are on, that I looked at you as you were on one side mm -hmm. and I was on the other side. And, and I was like, I'm like, I'm just not doing this. Right. Anytime someone started pointing out what the divorce agreement said, right? That in verbatim putting it into an email yeah. and or a text message, you knew that we were clearly not communicating. If you got a three paragraph text, we're not speaking, right? Yeah. Like that all of that was really, was really bad. I think the email, <laughs> yeah, the email, the, email. the emails, cause the emails are admissible in court. So if you got divorce quotes yeah. and in an email, you knew you were yes. really in deep shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but when we had those collective group meetings or you had the birthday parties or you had the kids saying, can we do a dinner together and you would walk into those situations it, that's like a constant lump in your throat in in mine like it was I mean half of those times you know those dinners that we would have to show like family co-parenting that like someone would end up really pissed off uh -huh. the girl one of the girls would end up crying and not wanting to you know it just it didn't feel good I mean that is a really interesting point and I didn't even think about that but it's true because what ended up happening was we collectively all decided that we were gonna have this blended family, right? We had this ideology. Very quickly, yeah. very quickly. We yes. had this ideology that this is what we were gonna do. So mm -hmm. then we took the steps 
in order to make that happen by mm -hmm. going to a dinner where we all went or yeah. having like a group birthday party together. And mm -hmm. we thought, I think that at least for me, I thought that it was like, okay, I'm going to suffer through this for right now, but right. it's going to be for the betterment of the kids. Mm -hmm. And then when you did it and the kids are like, this sucks and is really uncomfortable and they have these like backlashing you know tantrums or have these like really big feelings they feel the energy out. then then you're like well what the hell am i doing yeah why do i keep subjecting myself to mm -hmm. this like literal torture it felt like torture. it was torture yes was, like why did we keep doing that my why was that it, you know i didn't want and i don't want the girls to look back and say I had a stepmom who was trying to take the place of my mom that in that in retrospect makes me sad, right? But that they can look at it like, oh, I represent a different parental figure, right? Mm -hmm. Like, here are all the things that my mom did for me that are different than what Denise did for me. And there are so many of those things, right? Because we're because so, we're such different people. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. But I want them to look at that and just say, I had three parents, I'm so lucky, and it's super positive. Yeah. My why was kind mm. of similar but also different. Yeah. Because I really knew that whatever I did from the divorce on out was going to be the fabric of their childhood. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I had two choices. I could either be super bitter and pissed off and my kids would then, which would feel really good, to be honest with you, that would feel really good at that time. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? To yes. just be like, F you! And like, just yeah. say like, I'm gonna go on my own way and I don't care <laughs> about what you think and I never wanna see you again. You know, that would have felt really good at that time, yeah. you know? The harder part was like, ha like really hiding that. Yeah. And, but for me, I was like, whatever I do from here on out, this is what my kids are gonna look back at their childhood and say, oh, my mom was this, or my childhood was this. And so I really, tr really did my best to be intentional about what that story was for them, you know? So yeah. like, I would go to the birthday parties and I'd wear sunglasses because I like couldn't help but cry like the whole time. Mm -hmm. And um, it even makes me like tearing up talking about it yeah. because it was like so painful mm -hmm. and it was like so difficult to like keep doing that but i just kept remind reminding myself like no you want to be remembered as somebody who is strong mm -hmm. and did the best for them mm -hmm. not somebody who was like bitter and angry yeah you know and so and that that was what i just like kept doing it yeah i just kept doing it and kept doing it and i kept showing up mm -hmm. and i kept like thinking about that stupid video mm -hmm. and i kept like just going, right. you know? And then, you know what the funny thing is, is that when you do that, it's like any kind of routine or any kind of like change or whatever. Because the when I first started doing it, it was like the worst thing ever. I would rather be waterboarded. Mm -hmm. And then as you keep going, it's like little by little, tiny increments, it got better. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It just like got more comfortable. It got less awful. Like the kids got more used to it. And it wasn't this like overnight success. Mm -hmm. It really was like incremental, tiny little baby steps that were almost so small and insignificant that you didn't even notice. But then over a long period of time, you look back and you're like, wow, this doesn't feel so awful anymore. Yeah. You know? And then like over even a longer period of time, you're like, wow, that was pretty enjoyable. I had fun. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, and I don't know how, if there was like ever really a turning point that we were able to like really get there. Yeah, you though also were in a situation too where there was a consistency. Mm -hmm. I was there the whole time, Yeah. right? And then they, and they knew that and they were so young that it's like all of a sudden you fast forward two years and it always, it was this way. Mm -hmm. Where you walked into a situation not knowing, you know, you're gonna be divorced and what that is and trying to, at the beginning of being broken, manage, you know, dating and what that is with kids. And there were up and downs with that related yeah. to it that I think, you know, we had fits and spurts of things working. And some of those were associated directly with how kids were managing, you know, what their consistency was, which yeah. was just you versus you with a partner, which yeah. is, which on, you know, Seth's side was, uh, he has a partner, but we're okay with that because that's what it's been from the beginning. Yeah. And that's, I mean, even now, right? That's a, that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing to manage. I mean, I think that like initially I was kind of like, jealous a little because I felt like the kids were gravitating towards like your guys's household because you did have that consistency mm -hmm. and 
I tried to create that consistency with like some random dude, you know, because I was like, this is like what they, this is what makes them feel safe and comfortable. Mm -hmm. But really it was like the opposite. Yeah. So it was like, as much as I would like to say that, oh yeah, we're doing all the right things. I had to do all of the wrong things to get to the right thing. And I, and the thing is, is, I mean, I think the whole reason for this whole podcast and sharing all of this is Mm -hmm. that you can have an idea of what you think the right answer is, but like really kind of doing a lot of the wrong things helps you figure out what the right things are. And like, there shouldn't be any shame or guilt or feeling the need to hide the wrong things, you know, like we should be able to give ourselves the permission to explore Mm -hmm. and to figure out what works for us. You know, I mean, like I know that a lot of the narrative of post-divorce is like, Hey, you're a single mom. You better hurry up and get in a relationship and get married again. Mm -hmm. You know? And so it's like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to hurry up and get in a relationship so I can like have that consistency for myself and for my kids. But that was like literally the worst thing I could have done. And it isn't until like, I actually took a lot of time just being by myself and really creating any kind of step like a major separation between me and my life and like my family life with my kids that things actually became more stable and consistent and that's like the opposite of what people tell you to do you know what I mean yeah yeah thinking of like what that turning point was in our relationship though and Mm -hmm. you know going back to the trust issue Uh but I remember in the middle of COVID that you called the girls in the morning and you were it was going through like a week of them not being nice, right? Just yeah. being super disrespectful over the phone. And um, you came over. You were super pissed. Oh, yeah. I and, remember that. Yep. And and you and I got in a huge fight. Yeah. In the driveway. In the driveway. Yeah. In the driveway. Yes. No. And this was, like, not a little fight. This was, oh, like, major. screaming, mm-hmm. like, you know, Jerry Springer yeah. fight. Bad. And... I don't even know what the fight was about. The fight was about the fact that you, that the girls had been so rude and you're like, I'm coming to pick them up now because this has just been going on. Mm. And you felt that there was no support on the other end Uh. relative to the respect that they were feeling for you. Mm -hmm. And at that point we'd gone through what felt like, you know, maybe, maybe our first like three or four months ish of being okay. Yeah. But this had set you off. Mm-hmm. and But this was like not when we're getting divorced. No. It took a year and a half for us to get divorced. Yes. This was like probably three years in. <clears throat> yes, it was th- It was three. Yes, it was definitely three years in because I was pregnant. And that was around the time mm-hmm. that it happened. And um, you were so emotional over the disrespect that they were giving you. And I was sitting there telling you that we're consistently supportive of you in the house. And we're not talking in a way that would make them think it's okay to talk to mommy that way. Mm-hmm. But how how bad you felt about how your kids were talking to you was such a gut bust for me because it was just so clear that it was like we're so far away from where I thought we were going Mm -hmm. because you actually truly no matter what I say right now she thinks that's happening right there's something happening here and I remember telling Seth that that I'm like there's something happening at our house no matter what we say that makes her feel like we're not we're not being good co-parents to her yeah you know and that that's that sucked it sucked that you felt that way it sucked that we got in a huge fight that also the kids were very aware of yeah. you know on both sides and uh it, it it pivoted to like that wasn't the rock bottom I like the, it wasn't there but it was close I mean honestly I can't even I don't even think about those times mm-hmm. it like is mm-hmm. so emotional mm-hmm. that I can't even it's like PTSD totally so yeah, that was really <laughs> shitty. It was really shitty. It was really shitty. That was but really tr- shitty. But it goes back to a trust thing. It was like you didn't trust what I was saying. But, but you're right. It was a big thing for me to just like stand up for myself. Yes. Like it. Like there were m- incremental moments throughout those years that I like legit, and I lost my shit over it. Like I, le- I didn't handle it in the best way. But but I was. It, it really, I needed to do that. Yeah. But that was in the summer. And then we kind of came back from it. Mm-hmm. And we always had those moments where it felt like then we're in a shitty place again. We were like binge dieting kind yeah. of. We would be like really good for like a couple of months. We'd be like, oh, we're so much better. We're losing weight. <laughs> totally. <laughs> we're losing weight. We're looking good. All snatched. And then big. We eat a whole chocolate cake. <laughs> yeah. Everyone just went back into their holes. Yeah. No one was texting. It was all through email. It was like really one of those things. Yeah. And it would always end up coming up when we start talking about planning trips, uh-huh. right? And which always, I mean, for those, not three years, like I'd say like the first four plus years, 
always stressful. Like, yeah. I don't know how you felt, but it was like, we're sitting there being like, fuck, what are we doing? Like, okay, we got to figure out Thanksgiving and then we have to figure out the holiday and then we have to figure out. It's really Christmas. It's Christ- because right. everybody it's Christmas. wants to see the kids on Christmas. I remember for me, the rock bottom was when I was when we had that big fight over Christmas. Yeah. Because um, I remember I had agreed to let the girls go and spend Christmas Eve. Mm-hmm. But then as the it started panning out, mm-hmm. I realized that like what your plans were yep. and the plans and because in my head I made an assumption that like they were gonna spend Christmas Eve with you guys, but like I would come over before they go to bed, you know, because you guys live five minutes down the street, and then I'd wake up you would, when they wake up, I could come over and watch them over so I would be involved. But then when I heard that you guys were taking them to Manhattan Beach and that you guys were gonna be at your parents' house, mm-hmm. and then I was thinking to myself, that's going to be really shitty for me. Yeah. And you were in Florida at the time. And so on our, right. And when you, when you had decided you didn't want to do this. Yeah. And you know, as you learn about people, you also are a person who's very like matter of fact and going back to what that was because of like people's triggers. It was, I'm allowed to do this because it's in the divorce divorce contract, which is true, which is true. (laughs) But it's like, okay, well, if we're going back there, she's also clearly in a place where she's just, you know, she's not happy and something else is going, it felt bigger, right? And it was one of those things where for me, even more than Seth, it was like a whole trust thing was triggered on my end where I said, fuck that. I feel like I'm trying to work it out. I'd heard absolutely nothing that you had said relative to any of it because I felt like I was like, you'd completely pivoted off of something we'd agreed to. And I think I total for me, yes, that was, because I remember the email I sent. I pulled out that entire divorce agreement. I copy and pasted stuff into the email. And I was like, I'm done. You can deal with Carrie for the next however long. You were serious. I was so mad. It was, she went into the <laughs> divorce decree. I did. I Third did. Party. Which I had never done, okay, ever until that moment. I was really not okay. Well, you know what was like, I was in Florida and I was talking to my sister and yeah. I was like, really like playing out. Christmas Eve and waking up. Yeah. By myself right. on Christmas morning, you know? And my sister said to me, she's like, you don't have to um, put yourself last all the time. Mm-hmm. Because what she meant by that was that, like, I was, I had this ideology that we were going to have this, like, blended family. Mm-hmm. And I wanted it so bad for them. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I was, like, going to, sacrifice everything in order mm-hmm. to give it to them you know because i was like yeah. i would but at that time i was sacrificing even myself mm-hmm. and like the things that i wanted mm-hmm. and the things that made me happy and it was like really like like ultimately i can't think of something more awful than waking up on christmas morning without your kids awful and that part right and that was and, and that part because I, I remember us talking about that you said just that right mm-hmm. and that was understand that was totally understandable it was, it was the lead up to that, right? Yeah. That we were having all these healthy conversations. And look, we also have an association with Florida that's not good. That took then, for me, a good three to four months to yeah. even be in a place of, Yeah, okay. you, were, you were pissed. I was pissed. I was pissed. Super pissed, but that was kind of a turning point for me. Yeah. Because like all of those moments where I stood up for myself, yeah. I, they, it came with this like level of guilt also because I just didn't do it right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I didn't, like my, my, the philosophy behind it was the right thing for me, yeah. but the approach was like a hard F. <laughs> so I was like, I gotta, I gotta like get it together a little bit more. I have to like communicate better. I have mm-hmm. to like think things through a little bit more. I can't always be the one that says yes to whatever I think the kids want. I have to like put myself into this equation and like find a healthy balance for Mm -hmm. me and these kids because it can't be 100% everything for them and it can't be 100% everything for me. There has to be some sort of balance. And I think that that Christmas was like kind of the turning point where I was like, I finally did it. But then I also had this realization like, you gotta change the way that you you're never mm-hmm. gonna get what you want if you keep acting like an asshole, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And so I really tried to like do better, Yeah. you know? That's like been a How did we even get over that? I don't even know. Time, I, I think it was time. And that's you know? the thing, it was like, it's all been time. It's all been time. After all those teary moments and all those hard conversations mm-hmm. and all of those like really shitty mm-hmm. times, yeah. it's like somehow mm-hmm. we've managed to like actually get into the blended family video place. Totally. 
And I don't know, I mean, I do know how we did it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really just time and commitment is ultimately like the two secrets. But I, like now, you know, I think I probably talk to you every day. Yeah. Like a couple times a day over. Mm -hmm. And like, it's usually regard, regarding kids stuff, but like you're here. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I called you up and I'm like, hey, I yeah. want to do a podcast about untraditional co-parenting. <clears throat> Will you come and talk about the darkest times of your right. life, please? <laughs> I think that going back to, I feel like I said that there was so much blind rage, right? And that blind rage turned into our version of blind trust. And this was at some point, probably the beginning of last year, mm -hmm. you know, and I held, like, I held on to the comment that you were like, you want to move on and have us be in a good place. That happens when it's supposed to happen or it doesn't, right? Yeah. Like you have control over what you do. Mm -hmm. And you and I have talked a lot about like generally my own control issues and what those are and wanting things to like look a certain, be a certain way. Yeah. And I can't control you. You're, you're a human being, you're a fucking adult. Um, and so at least for me, right. I was like, I'm just going to keep asking. It yeah. was like, Hey, why don't we go to the country club together and go to the pool and see how that was, where it was like, mm -hmm. you're not going to see from my perspective, the actions of having a healthy relationship where everything is cohesive, the support of you in our house is good unless you just see it, right? Yeah. Like if I tell you it, yeah. right? And I think that all of a sudden those situations just over time mm -hmm. became more comfortable yeah. in a really good way. And I think also for me, I kind of like worked a lot on healing, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. through like all of the different things that I was learning and all the experiences and all of the like, mm -hmm. um, things that I had investigated or chances that I had taken, I learned to like let that part go Yeah. because I was starting to realize that Seth wasn't the right person for me, mm -hmm. you know? And I knew that, but I didn't really like see it like wholly, mm -hmm. you know, until I was able to like really not hurt so bad and then look at the, have like no longer have blinders on the rest of the world and be like, actually we're really different. Mm -hmm. Like him and I are super, different. Do yes. you know what I mean? Yes. And, and then I'm like, wow, Denise is actually the perfect person for him because she is like on it. <laughs> like I am like, just like a, a bird that can't be caged in. You know it's what true. I mean? Yeah. And like, once I kind of had that realization that like, this wasn't the right thing for you, Carrie, mm -hmm. and it's okay to like, let it go. Mm -hmm. And then once I let it go and then I rediscovered who I was and became more confident in that person, mm -hmm. then it just became that much easier because I was like so grateful for the experience of being able to like find my own happiness again. And like mm -hmm. the idea of like being able to, to be happy, you know, yeah. and realizing like how real, really unhappy I was yeah. before, 100%. you know? So it's like, now I look at it as this like grateful graciousness where I'm like, wow, I'm really glad that I don't have to be in that position anymore, yep. you know? And that changes everything when you're like, Hey, thanks for, thanks for taking the baton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, like, I mean, you and I are such polar, talk to my friends about this. We're such polar opposites in most every way down to anything we could find an opposite right we would have never met in a normal life situation you know and i think like finding that finding those positives mm -hmm. and i feel like you and i have found our own version of a friendship in a way that even yeah. you know we went on our we went on our uh co-parenting modern family vacation and it's like we spent three hours sitting on a chaise lounge talking to nobody else to the point where the kids were pissed yeah you know and so it's, it's so it's nice nice to see that you know i think for me there was a lack of respect, right? I would always say that it's like, I respect Carrie as the mom of the kids, mm -hmm. but I don't respect her, mm -hmm. you know? And truthfully, I don't think that I did respect you as the mom of the kids because the decisions that would be made about stuff, small or big, mm -hmm. I could find something wrong with it in two seconds mm -hmm. because there was so much anger towards certain things, yeah. right? And I feel like that is a journey, right, for, for me in learning also that it's like, your way is just different. It's not wrong. Yeah. You know, it, you don't need to clip someone for like making a mistake that they're probably already aware of and vice versa. Yeah. You know, and that, that was like, that's taken time. And truthfully that it's like, that's also a beautiful thing. It's also a hard thing. I think as a co-parent to, you know, you have kids going back and forth between houses that are very different in the way that they function mm -hmm. and just realizing that it's just like, that's just the way that it is. Right. Yeah. You don't get to be the mom that you want to be seven days a week, mm -hmm. you know? And I think, you know, when I had Wyatt, that was the biggest, that was the biggest difference for me, right? Was like realizing that it was like, you, you understand the time piece, mm 
mm-hmm. that you're not with your kids seven days a week, mm-hmm. and that's got to be fucking hard. Mm-hmm. But also that it's like you're not they're you're not able to control their environment, and I don't mean it in the word control, but it's not your choice. Yeah, and that that's got to be difficult. I feel like that when you had Wyatt, that mm-hmm. was like another big change because it felt like you know you can't ever describe to somebody what becoming a mother feels Mm -hmm. like and how it changes you until you actually become one yourself. And there was, I felt like there was just a deeper level of understanding Mm -hmm. between you and I, and it was unspoken and subtle. It wasn't like, oh, you came to me and were like, I understand you better now. I just felt it. It was like a vibe, you know? Mm -hmm. And then as he's gotten older, you know, and we've, we see each other quite frequently and he knows me and he like, and there's no better feeling than seeing that little two-year-old <laughs> run into my arms yeah. saying Carrie yeah you know and then I feel like wow this is a full circle moment because that is how my girls who look to you you know and now I'm getting mm-hmm. what you have felt this whole time but I'm getting it in reverse totally. and I never would have thought that that was gonna happen yeah. or that I would like want to talk to Wyatt on FaceTime mm-hmm. as much as my own kids yeah. and like want to see what he's doing you know but it's yeah. like it just is a test Testament to our the commitment that we made. Is there any advice that you would have for somebody that's going through a similar situation? Don't date someone going through a divorce. I'd start there. <laughs> that's not. It's not good for anybody. And and probably for a tangent we will go off on makes the divorce process way worse. Um, be patient. I think that that's that was a big thing for me. Be respectful outwardly you know, like in, in a way that the other person feels right. Not in a way that you think that they should just assume. Um, and I really do believe in having a certain amount of blind trust in whatever they're doing as a parent. I think if I was to give advice, it would be to, you know, don't be selfish. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it's like when you're going through a divorce, it's very painful, but you know, try to take a outside look at yourself and at what you're creating in the environment you're creating, mm-hmm. give yourself grace. You're not gonna do everything right. Mm-hmm. You have all these big things happening, mm-hmm. you know? Just try to do the best you can mm-hmm. when you can at that time. And you're going, and be forgiving of yourself and others. And like, as long as you keep an eye on the prize, which is having like a very good, healthy family whatever that looks like to you, like keep moving towards that. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to like, it's not going to be sunshines and rainbows all the time. It's going to be a roller coaster, Mm -hmm. but eventually it'll, it'll get better. And I think it's just worth pointing out, like the girls, 10 and seven are doing great. We talk about it all the time that they're like in the best case divorce situation. They could, they could ever have ever. They have three people who love them a ton. Their and, life is, doesn't feel fractured. And everybody plays a different role. It's yeah. not, we don't play the same role. We all play a different role, which how lucky are they? They get a third role. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? That mm-hmm. you add, I don't feel like I am threatened by you anymore. I'm like, wow, it's really great that Denise is so organized and she can handle the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> Right. There's the, the, the non-threatening level yeah. has come down on both sides. Okay. Right. So, um, before we leave, and I want you, because like mm-hmm. I am the queen of disaster dating, mm-hmm. um, I want you to tell me if you can even remember a mm-hmm. disaster date that you've been on. Okay. Your worst one. Worst one. I always say it's like, it's not, it's just not going to be your level because it's just no one can. Listen, this is, no one can. This is an art, okay? (laughs) Bad dates are an, are a subtle art that I somehow have. (laughs) Um, I was coming out of a relationship and this was like when Hinge was first Hinge and like plenty of fish was still a thing and like grouper was the thing and people were, it was a very weird dating situation. I've never even heard of grouper. It's like you would go on a date with three people and another three people and then like hope that somebody matches. I feel like I should be on grouper. That sounds way better. Yeah, that did, it was unsuccessful. So maybe you should, maybe you should restart it. I totally agree. And my girlfriends were just like, just go, like go on some dates, see what happens. And we'd gone to dinner and it was totally normal and it was totally nice. But it was like a, it was like a, it was like a bar dinner situation. Okay. okay? Lots of people there. Not so like quiet. sports bar Nothing intimate, super sports bar but like totally getting along. And like halfway through, I had to go to the restroom. I came back and there's another girl that's standing at the table. Uh-huh. 
and talking the, to him talking to him but okay. they knew each other very very clearly knew each other okay and the conversation very quickly pivoted to interest in the three of us like having some sort of sexual relationship like i mean like within two to three minutes of me and none of the conversation we had was sexual touched anything about threesomes okay well wait a minute and it was just like even get in i don't know oh i just ran into so and so at the bar like you know don't you think that she's pretty like what yeah oh i think that she's pretty what do you think denise and it was like that she's like well maybe we should go i swear to god maybe we should go back to my apartment after this that would be super fun and like the three of us could like all hang out and like you know, it was it was very like aggressive and aggro and so weird i was like i'm good and then it's over and i'm like this is the craziest first date ever that is 100 that is definitely a disaster date i have never experienced <laughs> the but worst listen there's still time there's still time <laughs> yeah please please don't one up that one that's <laughs> That's, that wouldn't be good for anybody. Yeah, no, let's hope not. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see. You we'll know, see. <laughs> be careful on what you don't wish for. <laughs> All right. Well, that wraps up this episode of Diary of a Divorcee, the podcast. Of course, we always want to hear any kind of comments, concerns, questions, or if you want to share your disaster dates, you can always uh, email us at Diary of a Divorcee podcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks on for having today. me. It was, this was nice. I know. And I feel like we really ironed out some things ironed today. Out. Yeah. All right. Right, high five for us. <laughs> high five for us. <laughs> <laughs>